But today we're here for business. We're here to dive into God's word. We want to see what God would teach us through his word today, right? So, and then we want to extract the principles here uh, and live those out. If you're new with us, I think I started down this road a while ago and got lost already. But if you're new with us, we teach books of the Bible, right? We open our Bible together. We study it together. We extract principles together. We go in an Old Testament book and then a New Testament book and then back to an Old Testament book. And so today we find ourselves uh, in chapter 20 of the book of Joshua. So um, that, it's interesting today. That's not the right chapter. Chapter 20. Here we go. It's interesting today because what we're seeing and we're asking this really incredible question, the, the people of God are now in the promised land, right? They're, they're in the promised land, they're um, establishing their lives, and here's the deal, they're establishing their lives together, right? Here they are together, and so we're asking the question, how does God's people, how does Israel live together? How do they live among themselves with peace and harmony in the presence of God. And because as you and I extract principles from there, don't we want to live together in peace as his people? And we know this, right? This is no secret. We live in a world that's totally, unequivocally affected by what? By sin. Yes, there's your answer. We sin against each other, don't we? Many of you in this room, you have been sinned against, and we don't need to ignore that. We can acknowledge that. You have literally been hurt, and you've been sinned against, and some of you in this room have sinned against others, haven't you? We live in a world that is totally affected by sin, and even whenever we don't intentionally sin against one another, we accidentally sin against one another, right? Or unintentionally sin against one another. And so as, as we live together as God's people, as a community, how do we live with harmony and peace in the presence of God in our midst? I think it's a good question for us to tackle. As you and I live in this community, right? I've been paying attention over the last few months about Murfreesboro. I've lived here most all of my life, right? My family moved here in 1988. My mom was like, we need a new life, single mom, three kids, took a job working in Smyrna as a National Guard Army full-time, ended up saying, I don't want to live in Smyrna, I want to live in Murfreesboro. Great. That's how we got here, right? So we've been here a long time. We've literally saw Murfreesboro go from this little bitty community to just an an enormously fast-growing city and community. And so as we've lived here and watched this every day, when you get on Facebook or on the news or the newspaper or whatever it is where you get your news, you'll find out that the the murder rates, that the the robbery rates in Murfreesboro are what? They're increasing day after day after day. I don't remember when I moved here. I don't remember even as a young adult um, all of the crime that we've seen today, all of the sin back and forth of one another in which we see in Murfreesboro today. I'm told that there's even gang violence in our community today and we did not see those things but yet we're seeing it on a rise. So there's no doubt in your mind, no doubt in my mind, that as we look at our environment and our world today, that that we simply are prone to sin and the effects of sin as we live together. So Israel are in their land together. They're becoming a people. And, And you would ask, well, what's the big deal about living in peace, right? Because this is actually a very important principle that they're wanting to live, or God is wanting his people to live in peace because peace preserves worship. Peace preserves worship. In other words, some of you have been in church families or church environments in which there's very little peace, right? And how was your worship affected in those environments? In other words, if the the church body is not on the same page, if they're in conflict together, it does not preserve worship. As a matter of fact, it does the opposite. It causes or it, it causes uh, worship to cease or at least to be difficult for many of God's people. Some of you are like, I've been there, right? I remember those days. You, some of you are saying, I went through a church split or I went through whatever. And, and you would say, you would say, he is absolutely right. Peace and unity. What that does is it preserves worship. That is God's agenda for his people. Their primary goal is to keep from being distracted, to keep from being distracted by sin. And peace allows that to happen. So apparently, just like we're dealing with sin, they too are dealing with sin. So how did they deal with it? Let's look together at chapter 20. We'll start at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, 
appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses. We'll come back to that in just a minute. That the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. There shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. We'll go over that in a minute too. Verse 4, he shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city. Then they shall take him into the city and give him a place and he shall remain with them. Verse 5, and if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment until the death of him who is the high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home, the town from which he fled. This is not a new concept. Remember, he's saying, I'm implementing something. Joshua, I want you to carry out. I want you to implement this cities of refuge. There's going to be six of them. And I want you to carry those out. And I shared this concept with Moses. So what we've got to do is we've got to flip back for just a minute in our text. We've got to flip back. We'll have it on the screen for you. Or if you're looking in your Bible, it's Numbers chapter 35, right? So that's where we're introduced. And Moses is told how to handle these cities. It's given us the instructions for the cities, the description of the cities. But it's also, it's given us some illustrations. It's helping us to understand better what is going on in these cities of refuge if we flip back to Numbers chapter 35. So I'm going to give you just a second to get there as we flip back. Now again, these examples are going to be further explanations of what these cities are to look like. So let's look at, uh, um, let's see, Let's look at verse 16. But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. So this is inside the cities. This is what's going on is they're in the cities and he's explaining what's to take place in these cities. And so they've come there to the city, this man, and he's given us an illustration of how to deal with a man when he comes to the city. And verse 16 says, but if he, if he struck him down with an iron object, object so that he died. He is a murderer. Can I ask you something as we pause here for a moment? Is there biblically, is there a difference in a murderer and a killer? Someone who kills and a murderer. Is there a difference biblically? If someone is defending themselves and kills someone, is that murder? Okay. If someone, um, goes to war. The government has declared war on another people for whatever reason, and this person at war kills someone. Are they a murderer? Again, the answer is no. See, there's this very interesting thing. Sometimes it's hard for us as Christians, as believers, as we look at scripture, we want to take everything and make everyone a murderer, right? If you shot someone, if you defended yourself, then you are a murderer. That is not the teaching of scripture. Scripture holds two different teachings here. And this is a place where it's introduced for us. Uh, Just kind of for your knowledge, if you're looking at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments said, thou shalt not, is it kill or murder? Thou shalt not murder. murder. Actually, it's murder. The best translation there is there, thou shalt not murder murder. And so what we need to know as believers, we need to understand that there is a difference there. And this is a tough teaching, but the best overall teaching of scripture in looking at this is that there is a difference in someone who kills and someone who murders. There's a very big difference. So let's look at what he says. He said he's a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Verse 17. And if he struck him down with a stone tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death, or if he struck down with a wooden tool that could cause death and he died, he is a? The murderer shall be put to death. Verse 19, the avenger of blood shall himself put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. We're going to cover exactly what that means in just a moment. Verse 20, and if he pushes him out of hatred or hurls something at him, lying in wait so that he died, or an enemy struck him down with his hand so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a? The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death 
when he meets him, verse 22. But if he pushes him suddenly without enemy or hurled anything at him without lying in wait or used a stone that could cause death and without seeing him dropped it on him so that he died, though he was not his enemy and did not seek his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of the blood, avenger of the blood, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he has fled, and he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of his city of refuge to which he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of the city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. For he must remain in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. Do you know you're going to have so much fun at church today? So you're like, how many of you are like, I didn't even know that was in there, right? I didn't know we were taught. I did not know some of these things were in Scripture. You've got to put yourself in the time of the Israelites, right? This is before, this is not, hey, we have courts in every downtown square, right? This is before all of this. And so this is a total different culture. And what they're doing here is they're literally implementing these cities of refuge. Some of you are like, what exactly, in simplest terms, is a city of refuge? Well, here it is. It's six cities spread throughout Israel for those who have accidentally killed someone, right? So they didn't do it on purpose. And this is the place where they flee to. And when they flee there, they have protection against the victim's kinsman uh, redeemer. And they have protection from them while or until, until justice is determined. In other words, the elders, the congregation will hear the case. And they will make a ruling and a determination to whether this was an accident and they get to remain in this city or whether they are a murderer and must be put to death. Some of you are like, did we base some of our court system on some things that took place in ancient Israel? Did we base some of it on the scripture? Seems pretty clear that we did, right? We did. So the cities of refuge, bold down their simplest terms, the cities of refuges are a place of, and write this down, a place of justice. A place of justice. Today, mm, as we see the why and the how of these cities and we extract principles, I want us to, to, to picture in our mind this place of justice. Isn't it? Difficult, as we talked about in our connect, group, connect groups this morning, it's so difficult to imagine a place of true justice. Aren't you in your heart of hearts? Don't you just desire sometimes to know and to hear the truth, right? How often do we look at our leaders or those in authority over us as we discussed this morning and you think, I just don't believe a word they're saying. Something in you aches for justice. You desire for truth, don't you? You want to see the, the king of kings. You can't wait until the day of revelation comes and you stand before the king of kings and you know that when he speaks to you, you know that the words of his mouth are true and you know that his decisions are just and you long for that day. These cities are supposed, supposed to point to that day. In these cities of refuge, you say, well, why have the cities of refuge, right? Why have them? Well, the individual sin of the individual, it has implications for the whole community, as we're going to learn more in just a second. But they also have physical consequences and for the good of the whole community, for the good of the entire community, they need to deal with sin severely, right? They need to make sure that they've listened, that they've heard, that they've made a decision and they've got to deal with it because it will affect the entirety of the community. Don't we do the same thing even in our country today, right? That's why we have capital punishment in most states. They've made the decision that, that this issue of murder, we will murder one another, we will sin against one another and it's egregious and it has effects on families and all of those extended families and the community itself and people will walk in fear and so many states have said, you know what, we're going to implement this and when we implement this, the goal is that it is severe, 
That when you are a murderer, you will be, just as this scripture says, dealt with harshly and you will be put to death. And everyone will see that and will know that. And the goal is a deterrent, right? It must be dealt with. That is a principle of why these cities came about. God himself, the second reason that God himself, get this, this is important to know, his very nature, his very nature is just. Do you love justice like God loves justice? He judges without partiality, doesn't he? Mm. When you think about God, you think about his perfect, righteous judgments. Let me ask you this question. When you think about his people, do you think about the perfect justice of his people? See, when we talk about believers, when we talk about Christians, when I look at you, when I think about Christianity, I ought to see those who tell the truth, those who love justice, those who stand in the gap when justice is not prevailing. Is that true about you this morning? Principle number one on your listening guide, God's people must love and seek justice. Again, it's this idea that God himself is just. God himself is holy. God himself is pure. God makes no mistakes. And he hates injustice. Do you believe that about God this morning? Do you believe that about God? Do you tend to hate just injustice like God hates injustice? Do you tend to ignore injustices? Or do you tend to stand in the gap and say, no, 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 no. This is not right. This is not right justice Mm. in our sinful flesh in our sinful nature we tend to tend to treat people very uh injusticely don't we we tend to to justify with so many numerous ways in which we can justify that i would share with you even this week as a convention most of you know you see the sign out there you're like okay this is a baptist church we're part of the southern baptist convention there's forty-eight thousand churches and and they we meet once a year right i didn't go this week but we meet once a year they met in phoenix this week and they're dealing with some of the injustices of the past that as a convention that we've believed and they've said that you know what we cannot we understand proverbs that god hates unjust scales and we can't ignore some of the the injustices that have taken place in our convention over the past couple of hundred years. And so they've begun to deal with some of that, some of the unfair treatment of even some of the minorities in our convention. And so as a convention, we are looking at that and we have said a couple of things. We said we believe that we are all, no matter our race, no matter what we look like, that we are made in the image of the creator God. That we all have the same value, the same worth in the, in the eyes of our creator. And even this week, as you probably heard on Fox News and some of the newscasts, I think they, they didn't paint the picture very fairly of what was going on. But there was a, a motion made that is a Southern Baptist Convention that we uh, condemn the alt-right, which is a white supremacist group, right, that's rising in the nation today. And there was this, this motion put forward that we condemn that together. And what happened was there was some questionable language in there. So they said, wait a minute, we need to get this right. This is a big deal. We need to get it right. So they pushed it back on the table and they said, we need to talk about it tomorrow and, and make sure that we get the language right. But the news, they weren't very fair in their uh, treatment of the Southern Baptist Convention even this week. And so most of you probably heard that there's all kinds of problems and that that we couldn't come together in unity in this. And that is absolutely false. That is not the truth. They pushed back and they met again and they got the language right and almost unanimously, almost unanimously, I think there was three votes shy out of like, I think it was 5,000 registered uh, folks there. So out of the 5,000, there was like three that voted against it. They made an incredible decision to say, you know what? We condemn that language. We condemn that. And we are all made in the image and likeness, imago Dei, of our creator. Even this week, you think, well, that's far, right? That's far. The alt-right are kind of crazy anyway, right? So you're like, I don't even know any of them. Even in our own county, if you've watched this week, the news report put out this week following the Southern Baptist Convention's decision and condemnation of the alt-right, in all of our courthouses in Rutherford County, there was white supremacist groups that dropped off the flyers in all of our courthouses here in Rutherford County. They wanted this to, this movement to move. And let me tell you something. This, Christians, we cannot stand for that, can we? We cannot stand for that. We are made in the image of God. God's people, we must love and we must seek justice for all. Mm. 
if you hate a group or an individual because of their race, because of their gender, whatever it is, you are treating them. This is sin. You are treating them unjustly, and it is sin. And by the way, they have an avenger, and he will come on their behalf, and he will avenge on their behalf. You know what his name is? Yes, we'll shorten it. We'll say Jesus, right? He's coming on our behalf. Thanks, Trent. That's Trent back there. We have no tolerance. Number two, principle number two as we read this scripture together is that boundaries allow God's people to live together peacefully. And there needs to be boundaries in how they interact. There's cultural principles of redemption and retribution here in this scripture that we read. And this is important because it talks about the avenger of blood. And we need to explain this because this is setting some boundaries here. You've heard probably of Goelism, right? Goelism. This is the idea. As a matter of fact, I'll see you in a minute. I've got a tattoo of it on my arm there. But this idea is, is really simple. It's this idea of redemption. If you've read the book of Ruth, right? This idea of um, redeeming someone. So let's say there is is a man and he is has a brother and his brother is married and his brother dies gets killed you know this brother's responsibility the man's responsibility is to take in his family and to raise them as his own to redeem them let's say a slave as an example a slave is in slavery and there is a man who will come and pay his way out of slavery it is said that he has bought him or he has redeemed him from his slavery so this is the responsibility to the book of ruth for the kinsman redeemer it's someone who's kin to the person who redeems them who at their own expense their own cost redeems them buys them back goel that's the word and so but there's a second part and that's the the tattoo i have it's goel that's in hebrew right in a really cool font and it reminds me that i am one like ruth i am one who is redeemed i am one that that jesus himself paid the price for me as i worship i can see goel right? I am redeemed. But there's this other side of that. It's redemption. And there's this other side of it too, of retribution. So in other words, it's where we get this idea from scripture, an eye for an eye. So if, if you murdered my brother, right, you murdered my brother, of course I had to redeem his family, but I also had an obligation for him on his behalf to kill you right? To take your life. It's where this idea of an eye for an eye come in in the midst of scripture, Goelism. And so some of you are like, you know what, this eye for an eye thing, it really, um, it really rubs me the wrong way. Some of you are like, I don't like this eye for an eye, right? You're like, I, I like some things, but this is one hard teaching of scripture. And I want you to know this when this was taking place, right? When this was implemented, this was what was, what was God's grace and mercy and God's people uh, mercy because what would happen, human nature says this, you poke out one of my eyes, you know what I do to you? Poke out both of them, right? If you uh, knock out one of my teeth, human nature says, I knock out all of your teeth, right? And so what was happening here in Goelism was like, you know what? God was implementing this and he was saying, you know what? If they poke out one eye, you're only allowed, it's restraint, right? You're only allowed to poke out one eye, right? If they knock out one tooth, you're only allowed to knock out one tooth. And so this was actually a better law, this limited vengeance among God's people, And so this city of refuge, this would be a place really of safety for when this person would flee to it, he would, and he would flee to this city and he would find justice. He would be able to stand before the elders. He would be able to have his day in court. He would be able to share his story and he would be able to uh, have someone who is godly, who has thought through this, who has prayed through this, make a decision about his life. But he had clear boundaries. And anywhere where we have clear boundaries, there will be less chaos, less conflict conflict, much more peace, much more uh, harmony, right? Boundaries are a good thing. Some of your parents, you need to learn. Boundaries are a good thing. Some of you are like, I'm not laughing because my kids are sitting beside me and their grandkids are beside them. I'm laughing. We need boundaries, don't we? We need boundaries as adults, but our kids are desperate. They're hungered for boundaries. They respond when we give them boundaries. Let's move along just for time's sake. Principle three, here's our third principle. Justice allows God's people to live together peacefully. 
Justice allows us to live together peacefully. It reflects the nature and the heart of God. It causes us to treat people fairly. Are you known to treat people fairly? Employer, parent, are you a just person? Or are you always in conflict, right? If you are always in conflict, here's a little clue. You don't value justice, right? You don't value justice. If you're always in conflict, it's just a sign, really, of being unjust. And, and without justice, I think this, I think when there's no justice, if you look at God and you say, you know what, God is only love and he is not just, he is not holy, he is not all those things, then you cheapen and lessen God's grace to you, right? We know what justice demands of us. Justice would say, We got what we rightfully deserve, that you and I would be separated from God forever in a place called hell. But in his grace, in his mercy, in his goodness, he's given us the gift of salvation and forgiveness. But guess what? It only is good if you understand how just and holy he is and what you rightly deserved prior to his grace to you. So let's not cheapen grace by thinking less of justice. Mm. So the avenger, the avenger here, he may not understand, you don't understand his role. His role is to to kill the one, to avenge the death of his loved one, of his friend, of his brother, whatever that may be. But what he doesn't know, as he's chasing this guy, there are things that the avenger of blood, he doesn't know, right? Did he understand the circumstances around the death, right? Was it, you know, provoked? Was it in self-defense? Was it an accident? Was it actual murder? He doesn't necessarily know. And so as he's chasing after this guy this guy gets to the city and then he has his day in court and so he's going to let the elders let the leaders figure it out before he carries out his vengeance that's the fourth principle is that godly leaders allow god's people to live together peacefully you want peace you want justice have quality godly leaders and there will be peace, and there will be justice. Our world today, didn't we discuss this this morning in our connect groups? It is desperate, desperate for godly leaders. Churches all across America are desperate for godly leaders. Mm. So they would flee to this place. They would stand before these leaders. And by the way, who are these leaders that they're standing before? Who are these elders here in this city? Well, the cities are run by the Levites. There are six cities throughout Israel, throughout their new community, their new land. And this was important because they would flee to one of these six cities and stand before uh, the Levites that organized the cities. They would stand before the elders. And so there was an assumption. Who are the Levites? The godly men that ran the tabernacle and the, the temple and those things. They were the ones who understood the scripture. They were the ones who had this godly anointed wisdom on them. They would stand before them. I love that, that these cities, because they're kind of, they're located, every one of them. Think of the grace in this. Have you thought about this as you study this? There's six cities. Every one of these cities, I can't name them all. I can't say their names, but every one of these cities are actually within a day's journey from anywhere in Israel. So there's not, a, there's not a place in Israel that within one day's journey, you can't make it to one of these cities. As a matter of fact, these cities are, are and we'll cover this in just a minute, but these cities are very accessible to people. They had to keep the roads clear. They had to make sure that all of the access to these cities, that all of the ways to get there were clear, that you could stand before these godly leaders and at least have your case heard before these godly leaders and they would render a just verdict. Mm. No nation, no people, and as a matter of fact, no church, and I would even dare say no family can survive or thrive without godly leaders. Men, on this Father's Day, within your family, Within your church family, are you standing as a godly leader? I'm amazed. I'll tell you, this church, I, I love our elders, right? I've, we've eaten together. We've fellowshiped together. We've just spent time together. We've prayed for you together. In this body are some of the most godly men in leadership of any church 
anywhere. I'm telling you, they love the Lord. They love his word and they love you. They love justice. And so it's an honor to stand with these men here at Crossway. But are you, are you a trustworthy leader? Do you render uh, as opportunities justice? Do you have a passion for justice? Can we count on you? Here's the fifth principle as we end. The refuge cities point to Jesus who provide our protection from the curse, the law, and from the wrath of God. Hebrews 6.18 says that we flee to Jesus for, get this, we flee to Jesus for refuge. These cities are supposed to point you and I as we read, as we study. It's supposed to point Israel to Jesus. You get that this morning? They point Israel to Jesus. They point us to Jesus. You and I need refuge, don't we? We need a place where we can flee to away from sin and find refuge. And that was the cities for this people. And Jesus offers that from sin, from death, from the wrath of God that you and I rightfully deserve. Mm. Are you coming to Jesus for refuge? There's some historical information on these cities this morning, and I'll give you a few key things there. These cities of refuges, there was some rules around them, and here they are. The cities of refuges had to have um, clear and easy access. They built roads, right? They built road systems to these. They cleared out the bushes. They cleared out the, the, any obstacles that were in the way. They cleared them out to make sure that you had access to make sure that those of the day had access to these six cities. Every spring, the spring would come, and, and their goal for spring was to get ready. And I don't know if that meant like more people committed murders in the summer. I don't really know. But every spring, they would prepare the roadways. They would you know, prepare the bridges. They would cut everything away. And every spring, they made sure that there was access, easy access towards these cities. As a matter of fact, I'm told through some study and research, it was amazing to me that they actually put big signs up, right? That they had signs that would point people, cities of refuge. So if you were fleeing, if you're running, they had to be big enough, right? You, not like the little letters of you running and you can't see it. I mean, you're running you're like, wow, a billboard says this direction, this way, this is where those cities are. They were easily accessible. I think of how Jesus is like that, right? How many times in your life Jesus is like, hello, right? Your refuge right here in him. He gives us that same thing, doesn't you? That clean path. The city gate of these cities. The, the Levites, they kept these city gates open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm. Isn't Jesus like that too? You know, you can come to Jesus anytime. You wake up in the middle of the night, stress out, freaking out, right? What do you do? Jesus is accessible for his people. You have access to him day or night, 24 hours a day. He is our refuge city. These cities, the Levites, the, 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 the leaders of God's people, these guys, the priests, they actually kept the food stocked. They kept the cities stocked with food. So when you got there, of course, you've been running. You've been on a day's journey, right? And, and there was meals provided there for you. Jesus says, I'm the bread, right? I'm the juice. I'm the wine. I'm there for you open to all people. Did you know that this is where these cities were open to all people, not just Israelites? The sojourner, the, the foreigner who was coming through, they also, they were not turned away at the city gates. They were welcomed in and listened to and their case was heard and the decision was made. It was determined. It was welcome for all, not just the Israelites. Isn't Jesus kind of like that too? Right? Just as anyone who will come to me can be my child. And then don't we have this kindred spirit? You go, when you go to the Dominican, I see Tom over there. He's been three, four, three, four times with us. So as we go to the Dominican, they're a whole different race, a whole different national uh, idea and concepts of things. But you know what? When we get together, the family is coming together, isn't it? And they hug and they embrace and they talk about the scripture and all the things that we have in common. And you're like, man, these guys are family. They're fellow believers. They're, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Many of them will even call you brother, right? Because you, to them, and they'll say, you are my family in Jesus. And it's so true. You are family in Jesus. And they couldn't be different culturally 
than we are, right? They couldn't look more different than we do. But this is God's heart. And here's the truth about these cities. And it's the same truth about Jesus. There are no alternatives. For those who were fleeing the avenger of their blood, there was nowhere else they could go. Remember what it said? As soon as they are outside of these cities, then the avenger of blood can kill them and it's not murder. Did you read that? That's what we said. What the, the point is, they are the only way. They are the only hope for those who are on the run, those who need refuge. What does Jesus say about himself? I am the way, the truth. No man comes to the Father except in me. Did you know this morning that Jesus is the only, only way? He's the only way. The good news is that he's accessible. He is accessible for you. The gates are open for you. He gives refuge to you. Can I ask you something this morning? Why would you not run to Jesus? You are under the wrath of the avenger. Because of your sin, you will pay the penalty for your sin. As a matter of fact, according to Scripture, you deserve it. It's coming to you, and you deserve it. And you can't hide from it, and you can't ignore it. It is coming for you. Death, separation from God, paying the penalty for your sin is coming for you. But Jesus, but Jesus, the only way. He is your refuge. I ask you this morning, because of his grace, will you come to him? Will you come to him? Will you allow him to forgive your sin? Will you make him the Lord of your life this morning?